and welcome to Philosophy of X here on the Aspect Network. I'm your host, Alex Batts, and I'll be your guide as we take a journey to examine the world of X-Men through philosophy. As you can tell by the title, it's time for our bi-weekly interlude episode. In case you missed it, every two weeks we'll be having an interlude episode wherein I dive into the latest two episodes from X-Men 97. For this week, that means that I'll be talking about episodes 5 and 6, Remember It and Life Death Part 2. Unlike my reaction to the premiere, and continuing our trend from the last interlude, I won't be keeping this episode completely spoiler free. So, consider this your spoiler warning for episodes 5 and 6. If you have not watched them, I definitely recommend doing so before listening, or if you don't really care about spoilers, then carry on. With that, let's get into my thoughts on Remember It and Life Death Part 2. So, first up we have Remember It, directed by Emmy Unimura and written by Bo DeMeo. What an episode. It's been a week and I've still not recovered from this emotional mollywop. So this episode hits a couple of major story beats in X-Men history and continues the trend of this show moving at a breakneck pace. It honestly shouldn't work as well as it does, but this team pulls it off. One of the main emotional threads of this episode comes from the schism forming between Scott and Jean. They're growing distant and having a hard time reconciling the Madeline Pryor of it all. This is taken to another level when Jean learns of a telepathic affair that has been going on between Scott and Madeline for the past month. This is a super interesting way of combining the drama that bubbles in Scott and Jean's relationship because of Madeline existing with the telepathic affair that Scott and Emma Frost have during Morrison's run on New X-Men in the early aughts. It's exceptionally well done, and we even get some Jean and Logan romantic and sexual tension sprinkled in as well, wherein Jean kisses Logan surrounded by a literal wave of her own memories. The X-Men are the definition of a dramatic soap opera, and this show really gets that angle down. Still sticking with the mansion side of things, we'll get to Genosha in a minute, trust me, but we have Trish Tilby, a reporter, coming to interview the X-Men and attempt to shine some positive PR on the group ahead of Genosha's admittance into the United Nations. Trish is a great deep cut and her interaction with Beast is a point of the TV moment when considering her romantic history with the big blue guy in the comics. Her interviews also lead to one of the best scenes of the episode, in an episode packed with best scenes. Cyclops, at the edge of his stress levels due to the previously mentioned drama with Jean, is sitting down for an interview with Trish and, well, he kind of loses it. He becomes fed up with the pageantry and the condescension, the idea that mutants have to prove to the rest of the world that they are individuals, that they're people worthy of respect and a life that doesn't involve being hated and feared. He ends by emphasizing that they are different from humans and that humans should be thankful for that because it's the only reason they're still alive, making reference to the countless times the X-Men have saved the world. He then gets up and leaves. It's a literal mic drop moment. No notes, it's a perfect scene. And it's got hints of where we can imagine Cyclops' character going as the series progresses. Bring on revolutionary leader Scott Summers. Now for the Genosha of it all. God, okay. I'm just going to run through the plot here and bullet points, sort of, and then start to unpack it afterwards. So Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit are taking the trip to Genosha to meet with the Genosian Council ahead of the nation's admittance into the United Nations. The trio are greeted by Nightcrawler, who is amazing to see. He then shows Rogue and Gambit around the nation, and we get a sense of life on Genosha. Tons of mutant cameos, shout out to my boy Exodus, and we also get some not so subtle subtext about the importance of love and sin, specifically regarding sex. This episode is incredibly sexually charged, by the way. Magneto meets with the Krakoan, er, I mean Genosian Council, which features Madeline Pryor, Emma Frost, Sebastian Shaw, and Moira McTaggart and it's revealed that they want him to lead the nation-state. He agrees on one condition, that Rogue join in ruling beside him. Here we get the episode outright confirming what was just previously hinted at. As Rogue explains the situation to Gambit, she reveals her previous entanglements with the Master of Magnetism. We're shown flashbacks of their romance in the Savage Land, and the revelation that Magneto's electric magnetic powers allow him to touch Rogue. Don't worry about the physics, it's weird comic book logic and it rules. I honestly can't believe the show went here, but I applaud it so much. We get Gambit and Rogue being heartbroken that they won't be together, and then we move into the Hellfire, er, I mean, Inauguration Gala. It's a stunning sequence. Magneto and Rogue share an aerial dance in which Rogue eventually rejects his proposal to rule alongside him. 
Then it all goes to hell. We hear Cable running towards the venue, telling them to cut the music and that, quote, he's coming, end quote. And he has a brief, heartbreaking reunion with Madeline Pryor, who realizes that Cable is a grown-up Nathan Summers. Cable is then pulled back into the future with what is, for my money, the coolest and most heartbreaking body slide by one I have ever seen. And then hell arrives. This is, look, I, I have chills talking about this. I'm nearly tearing up with it. I mean, we witnessed the genocide of Genosha. That's it. That's what happens here. I knew it was coming. That's what happens to Genosha. But to see it unfold and to see it unfold the way it does is just utterly heartbreaking. It's jaw dropping and it's pulse pounding. You can't look away, but God, you wish that it wasn't happening. Rogue, Gambit, and Magneto become our on the ground characters as they attempt to thwart the master mold that is wreaking havoc and deploying hundreds of sentinels onto the mutant nation. They are not enough to save the day. Magneto dies, though I'm not certain that he's actually dead. Gambit dies, and I am pretty certain that he's genuinely gone, at least until we maybe get to Krakoa proper in the future seasons. It's a gut punch. The entire sequence is some of the best animation I've ever seen, the action is stellar, and the performances from the cast are top tier. The writing is just unbelievable. Magneto gets one of the best final moments I've ever seen, Rogue follows it up by unleashing pure power and rage, and then Magneto gets an even better final moment like two minutes later. It's unreal. True MVP stuff. So the episode ends with the X-Men who are back at the mansion watching the news coverage of Genosha having been obliterated. I really, truly cannot praise this episode enough. It's some of the best television I've ever seen and just a masterclass in story adaptation. It goes from X-Men comics from the mid 80s to the early aughts within 25 minutes. It's genuinely unhinged and it somehow works perfectly. It blends Genosha and Krakoa in some fascinating ways too. The Genosian Council mirrors some ideology of the Krakoan Quiet Council, right down to the inclusion of Moira. For the record, DeMeo has air quote confirmed that Moira isn't a mutant in this, for whatever that's worth, so we'll see about that. Those who know, know. James Whitbrook wrote a fantastic piece for Gizmodo that gets more into the similarities and cross-pollination of Krakoan and Genosian ideals in this episode. I'll link that below, it's a fantastic read. This episode, I, I cheered, I cried, I was left absolutely shell-shocked. This is the peak of what stories can be, honestly. It's such a complete love letter to the X-Men, and also it's a perfect example of setting expectations and then subverting them. The first four weeks of this show really lulled the audience into a sense of familiarity and the idea that this show is going to embrace and arguably rest on the nostalgia of the past in the original series. Episode 4 gives us hints that they won't be doing that, with future Jubilee literally saying nostalgia is a trap and that the only path forward is forward. This episode, though, proves that this show is going to walk that walk. You thought you knew where this series was heading? Think again. Again, I'm just utterly floored by this episode. It checks so many narrative and thematic boxes while maintaining a rock-solid emotional core throughout, and I just can't get over how well it stands as an adaptation of some of the biggest and best X-Men stories. I sent out a tweet saying this last week, and I know it's partly hype talking, but we might need to seriously prepare ourselves for the conversation that this show is the best comic book adaptation, period. So that's Remember It. We'll take a quick break, but when we come back, I'll be diving into Life Death Part 2. Hi, my name is Nagan. And I'm Bree. Enjoying this show on the Aspect Network? Then check out Viltra Mics, an invincible podcast. Each week, we go back and discuss your favorite episodes of the series and review new episodes as they release right on Amazon Prime. Join us as we travel space, time, and the multiverse with Mark Grayson and discuss one of the most exciting superhero series on TV on Viltra Mics, here on the Aspect Network. And now, back to the show. Welcome back. So next up we have Life Death Part 2, directed by Chase Conley and written by Charlie Feldman. This episode follows two narrative threads. One is a continuation of Storm and Forge's story from Life Death Part 1, while the other focuses on just what the hell Professor Charles Xavier has been up to since his presumed death at the end of the original animated series. 
I'm going to start by talking about the latter. Unlike Motendo and Life Death Part 1, which presented its two narrative threads as entire halves of the episode, Life Death Part 2 consistently switches between its two threads, but I'm not going to do that. So, I'll be honest, it's been a long time since I watched the original X-Men animated series, and I'm not sure how much it was hinted at, implied, or outright stated that Xavier didn't actually die at the end, so I don't really know if it's a big reveal to audiences that he isn't actually dead in this episode. I only knew that he wasn't and that this was going to happen because, well, it's how it goes in the comics. His romance with Lalandra and the involvement with the Shi'ar Empire is one of the most integral components in X-Men lore. It was pretty thrilling to see that play out here though. We get the Shi'ar, Deathbird, Gladiator, and also Vulcan. Vulcan is wild to see in the background. He's the other Summer's brother, and he's kind of the worst. His inclusion has some major implications for the future of the series though. He's relegated to the background for most of this episode, which is probably for the best. Anyway, this whole plot is focused on the romance between Lalandra and Charles. It's sweet and also not at all subtle in a lot of the themes it's getting across. Assimilation, coexistence, and supremacy are all front and center in the debate that arises from Lalandra wanting to marry Xavier. Deathbird challenges the pairing, declaring that Xavier must be purged of all memories of Earth in order to show full loyalty to the Shi'ar Empire. Things eventually lead to a small skirmish, as these things often do, until Xavier pulls the group into a psychic classroom to lecture them on their hateful ways. It's a cool display of Xavier's power and a great reference to another oft-featured idea from Morrison's run, the psychic classroom itself. Things seem to be swaying in Xavier's favor until he receives a psychic vision of the death of Gambit and the destruction of Genosha, which utterly breaks his spirit and leads him to demand for his return to Earth as soon as possible. So, the other narrative thread, following Storm and Forge, is pretty straightforward. Forge was bitten by the adversary, a demonic owl entity creature thing that feeds on hatred and self-loathing, and needs a cure that can be found in a plant that grows in nearby caverns. Aurora and Forge ride to the caverns together, and upon arrival, Aurora is forced to crawl through anxiety-inducing tight spaces to reach the plant, all while being berated by the adversary. It's a great sequence that highlights one of Aurora's biggest fears. She's claustrophobic, which makes complete sense coming from someone who soars through the open air. The sequence also features Aurora mastering her fear and self-loathing, embracing who she is as a mutant, and regaining mastery of her powers while defeating the adversary. What results is a stunning scene of Storm breaking through the mountain plateau, soaring into the stratosphere, and emphasizing her utter control over the weather. She reforms her classic costume, headpiece, and hair and all, and of course is able to find the plant to heal Forge. While not a ton plot-wise happens with this thread, it's an exceptionally moving sequence that really gets to the heart of both of these characters, and it puts a deserved spotlight on Storm and how capable she is. It's awesome to see, and the romance between the two continues to blossom naturally. So I think that's it for these two episodes. Remember It is just stunning, and The Life Death Part 2 hits a lot of crucial character beats and once again proves that this show just gets it. I really, I don't know where the, the, the rest of this season is going. Like, based on the episode titles, I thought I sort of had some idea, considering E is for Extinction is the three-part finale, but E is for Extinction is the arc from Morrison's run that's the destruction of Genosha, which we just got at the midway point of this season. So, I'm not sure. It's really exciting, honestly, to be at the midway, now a little over halfway point, and not being entirely sure where this is going to end up by the end of the season. They continue crushing it. I have the utmost faith in this back half of the season, and I just, I can't wait to see what unfolds. So yeah, I think that's it for this interlude, and I'll talk about the next two episodes in two weeks. Thank you so much for tuning in to this interlude episode of Philosophy of X, and be sure to bring your metal detectors as next week we return for part three of our discussion on the Master of Magnetism, Magneto, and the Ethics of Mutant Liberation. You can find me online at AP Batman with two T's, and please be sure to subscribe here to The Aspect on YouTube and on any platform where podcasts can be found. Please give us a like, leave a comment, and turn on that notification bell so that you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on Twitter slash X, Instagram, and TikTok at The Aspect Co. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week.